Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three slightly higher than normal level uh, dungeons for different OSR games. The first one I'm going to be going through is the Reptile House, which is a Shadow Dark adventure for level three characters, maybe four through six of them. So it's a slightly higher than normal um, adventure. The second one I'm going to be going through is the Gravestone of Decay. There's no title page other than this. There's no cover page, I should say. Um, the Gravestone of Decay, which is for Old School Essentials, and it's for levels four through six of a party of varying sizes. And then the last one I'm going to be covering is the Vault of the Lunar King, which is system neutral and level neutral. Essentially what you get are room descriptions and a map and lots of cool details, but you don't get monster stat blocks and you don't get magic item um, power levels and you don't get random encounter tables. So this is a, this, you know, I'll talk about it more in a minute here, but this one is a lot more work to actually run, but it's also very, very useful as a, as a toolbox. So I'll come back to that one. The first one, as I said, I'm going to cover is the Reptile House, which is by Matthew Aaron Gorman. This is for Shadow Dark, and I think it's a great adventure. It's sort of like a region, really. I mean, you get a few, like, a lead-in. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say it's a region. It's it's like a, a more narrative... Um, I don't know how to put it exactly. You get kind of a, a, a description of an area, and you're going through it, but then it sort of leads you directly into the actual adventure itself. It's pretty narratively railroady, at least at first. Once you get to the dungeon, then you're pretty free to go as you'd like, but there's a lot of preamble. And I'm not sure I like that so much. A lot of people won't. Some people don't mind it. Either way, you can easily omit it and just put the dungeon into your world. Or if you want to run it as written, you can kind of do the whole thing. So basically what you have is, it's a really cool uh, location. It's a really cool idea. You have this place called the Pickbone Swamp that used to be kind of like full of old, you know, um, what you might say, mausoleums, tombs. Uh, it, was a, it was a necropolis, and it slowly over time has gotten really wet and you know soggy, and everything sort of sunk down into it. And there's still one place that's that's accessible, even though it's it's also kind of swampy and, and sunken. There's a lot of snakes around, and poison is an, el an important element here. And uh, you have a bit of the background of what's going on there. And there's tomb robbers trying to get to it, and then there are these owls, these intelligent talking owls, um, that are kind of enemies of the reptiles and the things down there. Makes sense, owls and reptiles, owls and snakes. But you kind of have like a, an introduction where you're ambushed, uh, you, you save an owl, and that's sort of like built in, that you save it, and then the um, you're ambushed by the tomb robbers who are going to hunt it, or they were they were cat, they caught it, and they were gonna eat it, and they're mad at you, so they decide to you know take your stuff, and then you fight back, and in the middle of the fight, the owls come and rescue you, and then they say, hey, we would like you to do this for us, which is go to this place, and get us this artifact or stop the, the evil that's happening there. It's pretty narratively, you know, as I said, driven. You're, you're, you're expected to do it, and you'll see there's a lot of text that is supposed to be read aloud, um, which again, some people are going to like, some people, are, some people aren't going to mind, some people aren't going to like, um, aren't going to like at all. But I, I don't, it's not the way I tend to run adventures. I don't do a lot of read aloud text, or I don't tend to have the players doing nothing, making no decisions, not role-playing for lengths of time. Usually if I'm going to read something to them, it's usually pretty short. But, um, but it is good. It is. It begins in media res because, like, one the, the first decision point the players actually get is roll initiative, or the first thing that happens. So it's like, do, 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 fight. Um, I might, if I were running it, I might have the initiative be the first thing, and then after the first round, of, maybe like read a paragraph of text after every round of combat. <laughs> that way, the players kind of get the background as they're going through the fight. I don't know. Something like that might be interesting. Um, you get the antidotes which are, again, because poison's an important part of this, there's a different kind of antidotes, and um, they do different things, and you kind of have to figure it out as you go, because you get some of these antidotes. There's an item that you could have bought or could have purchased. Maybe you start off with some of them. Uh, it's pretty good. It helps you against poison. And then here's what you, here's what you can see, as, as you'll see. It's a lot of, of read-aloud text, right? <laughs> a couple pages of read-aloud text. And then you get the Tomb Robbers, which are stat blocks and descriptions of them. Maybe a bit more than you need, but still, I think it's... This is definitely like... It, the the creator had an idea for how you should run this, how it should go, and is, is giving it to you as probably best practices, right? I don't know if you'd need to listen to all of this or do it exactly this way, but if you want it to be laid out for you, it is certainly laid out. And the map is really cool. I like the map. It's laid out very well. Here's where everything attacks. It has a much more, like, 5th edition... Uh, adventure vibe to me feels like something out of um, the early 
fifth edition books, or maybe any of the fifth edition uh, campaign books from Wizards of the Coast, where they have like a, an opening scene that you get, and you're kind of expected to play through it the way that it, it, it's uh, laid out. Less OSR. But, you know, again, I think that's not going to be a problem for a lot of tables. Uh, especially, again, if you're coming from 5e into Shadow Dark, then that's going to be more your, your habit. And this certainly opens up once you get to the dungeon. So it might be a good transition adventure or something like that. Um, Owls to the Rescue. I'm, I'm never a fan of this, where owls come, or like, not <laughs> owls come. The deus ex machina of, like, fight long enough and then the fight is ended for you. Um, I might just have this be, like, once the fight is over, the owls come in. Or if it gets really bad, then the owls rescue you, but maybe. But I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would have, like, a set after three rounds, the owls just come in and instantly win the battle for you. I feel like players can feel cheated. Um, whenever you have a, a fight with an automatic outcome, either victory or defeat, it feels kind of cheating. So I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do this either. But again, you'll see most of my problems with this adventure are with the preamble, with the stuff that gets you to the dungeon. Once you get to the dungeon, it's really cool. And, and again, I think a lot of players, a lot of GMs are, are not going to mind this sort of more railroady beginning where things happen and you kind of follow along and then you get to the decision points. That's pretty cool. Uh, you get looting the looters, uh, the king of the owls, and it's you know it's it's good descriptions. It's a cool place. It's a cool uh, idea, but it's again a lot of reading, and then or a lot of uh, reading aloud, and then you get to the actual role playing and the quest section. Probably he's gonna have they're gonna have to say yes, right? Um, they're they're I mean they could say no, but then the whole adventure is not gonna happen. So it's 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 one of those moments where once again you get to a point where there isn't really a choice if the players want to keep playing. There's sort of like, they can either say yes. I mean, they could say yes and then tr trick him, or, or they could say no and then go anyway. But pretty much they're going to go. And if they do go, then they get a bunch of stuff. You can give them a bunch of stuff. Six random antidotes, feather fall feather, two ancient keys, and a leaf from the golden oak. And the leaf from the golden oak is essentially a random effect that can help you. And some of them are really strong. Some of them are just pretty good, but, but many of them are, are, are quite good. So you pretty much want it. But they're all temporary. They don't last for too, too long. So it's kind of like a you know, boost for a few rounds. All right, here we go. The Reptile House itself. The random encounter uh, party, or the random encounter table, I should say, is, is pretty cool. You just get a D10. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not um, it's not uh, curved. It's just a straight D10 for the for the roll. Once again, you get a long description of what you should read. And you'll see that in every, every location, there's also a, a description, a read aloud description with Although, it's broken down into the stuff that's in there with more details and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. But again, once you get into the dungeon, it's it's pretty cool. And there's some very powerful magic items in here with spell books, with extra spells that are new. Uh, the, the, Liberis, uh, the Liber Draconis, right, the dragon book, uh, the book of dragons, is, uh, is has a bunch of spells that relate to dragons. So that's pretty cool. You've got some cool traps and tricks in here too. This is a tomb with interesting stuff and it's definitely you know, snake themed, <laughs> pretty, pretty through, or through and through. Um, you have some tomb robbers, so some rival adventurers that are probably not necessarily just hostile, but they're, you know, they're easily uh, able to double cross you. But it might also be a way to to replenish the players, give them some henchmen if they need, if you want. If it turns out to be a little too dangerous, then more dangerous than you expected, or the players aren't aren't getting lucky or something. But once again, you know, it, it's a it's a very very good dungeon. Very, very good dungeon. Solid. You've got um, stuff to explore, traps to encounter, uh, magic items and treasure to receive. It's all, you know, aimed towards the Shadow Dark, uh, you might say Shadow Dark level of treasure. So it's not like tens of thousands of gold pieces. It, you know, it's much more muted. It's much more lower. Or it's, it's lowered down, right? But I, I think that actually works for certainly Shadow Dark, and it could work for anything else too. But there are some very powerful items. Well, let's look at one: the Knife of Rebirth, an ancient embalming knife forged from gold and covered in glowing green runes. Using it upon a fallen character with a death timer causes them no immediate damage, and instead they rise with one hit point. However, the character then permanently loses half of their total HP. The knife can only be used once per day. That's really cool. Really cool. I mean, I it's it's a rough result, but it's like, man, we really need to get you back with a huge, huge cost, permanent loss of half their total hit points. I mean, hey, if, if it's the question between life and death, if the player really wants to play that character, right? You say, well, I'll use the Knife of Rebirth on you. I might say it's the, it, I might say instead of having it be while they have a death timer going, I would say if you use it on someone whose death timer has just run out, right, who's just died within a round or something, then, then it brings them back. 
with half their hit points. Um, because while their death timer is running, you're still trying to raise them, get them up. Uh, you get some fire and how that works against the Ophidian mummies. That's a cool idea. And then the mummy scrolls that you can find. There's a cool teeter-totter teeter totter cobra pit trap, which is a cool idea. The room itself shifts. That's something that I've seen elsewhere, but uh, it's, it's done to great effect here. And you get level two. It's a two-level dungeon. You have different random encounter tables for both. Um, and the second level is more cavey. It's less interesting to me, but it's still pretty cool. You have Zentara, who is the big bad here. And uh, the globe. <laughs> And then you get the lower catacombs again, the crocodile nest. You have these interesting things, the amphora, my amphora. Um, they're like mini decks of many things or something like that. Um, they remind me of the various things from like Barrow Maze or High Fell, where there's this random effect that can happen from death all the way up to you become immune to venom or plus two to your stats or, uh, you know, whatever it is, middle ground stuff too. Mostly it's not terribly good, actually. Basically one through eight seems like it's pretty bad. Um, in fact, yeah, they're all pretty bad, but you have the chance. 9, 10, 11, or 12 are all really good. So you have a 1 in 4 chance of something really good happening, a 3 in 4 chance of pretty much something bad happening. And it can be pretty bad, um, including death. So are you really going to risk it? Maybe. If you, have a, if you have a rough character, someone you don't like so much, maybe you'll try it. If you have a really char a character you really want to preserve, probably not going to use it. <laughs> anyway, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. Um, and all these effects can be removed with a restoration spell. So if you have a, a very powerful, you know, like a patron somewhere, maybe you can get that removed. Get some artifacts at the end. And the conclusion, of course. And again, it's more, more read aloud text. <clears throat> and you get rewards if you bring back the mysterious artifact and present it to the king. He gives you a bunch of money, uh, which is a bunch of money in Shattered Dark, a thousand gold pieces. And then he gives you these magic items. You get the spells in the Libra Draconis, and you get the map of the dungeon. It's pretty straightforward. It's not terribly looped, right? There's a couple loops. You can go G, a G H, I, Q, and then back to the center or up to S. Um, but that's the only loop on the first level. But what I really like about it is that it's it's looped between the levels. So, for example, P leads down. It's, it's a room with a wobbling floor. That leads down to the other floor. Um, you can go all the way to the right. You can see there's a pit that leads down above N. Um, there's two stairwells in S. Each leads to a different place. And so you kind of have a... A um, yeah, you kind of have multiple ways of going down. Uh, that pit goes all the way down to D D, uh, and so you have actually multiple ways of getting down to the lower catacombs too. So it's it's actually kind of looped that way as well. I like that. So rather than just being looped, um, you know, horizontally, it's looped vertically. I'm always a big fan of looped dungeons that go up and down with multiple ways of going down to the floor below. I think it's a good design. And then you have the, you know, if you're interested in this, pick up the next one in the series. So it's going to be a, a series of the Pickbone Swamps. There's more, more stuff to do, which is the Traveling Black Manor of the Withering Wood. That's a cool, cool name uh, for Shadow Dark. So this is the Reptile House by Matthew Aaron Gorman. Uh, a a Pickbone Swamp Adventure designed for Shadow Dark RPG. It's great. It's pay what you want on Drive RPG, so I'll put a link below to where you can get that. I think it's really, really cool. And 73 pages for pay what you want is awesome, right? So you can throw a couple dollars if you end up running this. And, uh, and I think it'll be just a great a great uh, dungeon, especially, again, if you have players who are newer to Shadow Dark, maybe they're, they're played a couple adventures so far, they're level three, and they want to do something, and you're, you're, you're more comfortable with, and they're more comfortable with, a bit more um, lead-in that's sort of just automatic, right? Less OSR, free, you know, do whatever you want, um, hex crawl, <laughs> sandbox style, and more like narrative, okay, we're going to play this adventure today. Here you go. I think that'd be great. The next one is the Gravestone of Decay. Now, this one's very, very interesting. It's a point crawl through a desert region that ends in a dungeon. And the setup is really, really cool. Essentially, there's been the sandstorm that has revealed... It's in the desert, right? So there's a sandstorm that's revealed uh, a tomb, and everyone knows that it's been revealed, this age-old tomb, and suddenly everyone wants to get it. Archaeologists and adventurers and cultists and all these people are rushing to get it. And so you, there are lots of rival adventuring parties. There are lots of factions. It's really, really good. I, I think this is a fantastic adventure in terms of the faction play that would be going on in the background. The dungeon itself is full of people and full of things to interact with. And again, the lead up to it is, is really cool. You're going to be interacting with different groups and trying to beat them and maybe helping one against another. And it's awesome. The ultimate goal is to get to the Gravestone of Decay, which is incredibly powerful. It's a, such a cool artifact. Um, it's game changing, campaign changing. So if you do have it in your campaign, you'd have to be very careful. Uh, maybe the goal is to destroy it, and it can be destroyed. 
but at a very high cost. So it's really cool. I like this uh, very, very much. Um, essentially, again, as I said, it's a, it's a point crawl. So uh, you don't get the point crawl until a little bit later, but you get a description of the different factions, the harvesters, the, a, a group of adventurers or a league of adventurers, the relic protectors, church of the desert wind, which is sort of a cult, and then the sand men, dudes that live out there. Um, and then you have some adventure hooks, 10 of them, different ways that your characters can be drawn to this place, which is cool. Uh, rather than having rumor tables, you have hooks. I like that. Sandwater Outpost, which is a basic place to start with encounters there, and those encounters are all pretty cool because they lead you into different ways of entering out into the desert. I think that's awesome. Um, and they're pretty common. Three and six chance for an encounter to happen whenever the PCs exit a building, finish interacting with locals, or walk the streets from one place to the next. So it's pretty, pretty likely you're going to run into some of these adventures. But there's not much to do other than the encounters in the outpost. There aren't uh, NPCs detailed at locations there. It's just an oasis with about 600 people and tents and stuff you can buy. And so if the players kind of want to like a, you know, pick up stuff at the last minute, maybe you put some more stuff there if you want. Um, and, and also there are some encounters out in the desert that lead back here that imply more of a power structure, imply more going on in the background, but it's not given to you. Uh, there's a gang of exiles out in the desert who wants to return and take revenge, and they and they can and will if you if you uh, the players end up getting tricked by them. So that's a whole thing. And if you wanted to include that, you probably want to develop the Sandwater Outpost a bit more. But I think it's cool as is. And if you just want to go straight out, then it's uh, totally functional. I would have them encounter maybe one or two of these encounters as you go. You have the encounter table with a brief description on the left, and then you have a breakdown of it uh, on the right. Preacher Pontar, False Leads, Serpent Lair, Menia's Broken Wagon, uh, looking for information, etc. Um, all the way down to the Wagon Merchant. Then you have the Way North, which is the point crawl itself. You have provisions needed, distance, and how to how, how long it takes, the random encounters. Uh, this is for old school essentials, so keep that in mind. It's not Shadow Dark. Um, and then you get the faction travels and, and what they're doing, how long it takes them, and if you encounter them, what's going on, the harvesters, the relic protectors, and the Church of the Desert Wind. And then you immediately go into locations without any indication. That's one thing is the format of this dungeon, is, the, of this document isn't my favorite. Um, I don't like the text font too much, but the, uh, that's, oh no, that's totally quibble. Who, who cares really about the text font? Um, it's the content you're looking for. And this is great content. But like for, it just goes right from the faction travels into the locations without any indication. So it took me just like a, a second to be like, wait, okay, is this, is, oh, okay, this is a location. Um, you know, an indication might be help, more helpful there having it be on its own page, right? Instead of just immediately going into it. But you got the Dust Temple Plateau and the Cactus Forest. You get a, a breakdown of the of the uh, point crawl. It's pretty straightforward. You're just heading north, and there's you know, a few choices about which direction to go. Um, you know, there, there are hubs that you're going to go through. You're going to have to go through the desert market. You're going to have to go through the seat. You're going to have to go through the wreckage. So those at least are the three that you have to see. Um, but you could go Dust Devil Plateau, Exile Colony Seat, or you could go Cactus Forest, Dry Oasis Seat, right? or Abandoned Wagon, Desert Market, the, the Coffin, the Ancient Battlefield, all that stuff's on the side. doesn't really do much. And a couple of them are pretty, um, like, nothing happens. Like the Coffin, it's like you just you just get there, and there's a Coffin in the, in the dunes, and if you open it, then the voice says, Beware the King, and it's like, okay, that's it. Um, so you might include reasons to go to these places if the players are interested in them. But they know where they're going, due north, so you'd think kind of just they're going to head there, probably. You get, the, again, continuing descriptions of the places. The exile colony, which there, there are some that are certainly more interesting than others. I think the cert, or the seat, excuse me, <laughs> it looks like an R. Uh, that's, again, the font. This is not my favorite there. Uh, the seat uh, and the ruined library are, are two really good ones. Um, I like those quite a bit. I also like the abandoned wagon. Desert market is a little bit strange. Why is there a desert market in the middle of the desert? Markets didn't show up in the middle of the desert. They showed up at oases. Um, you wouldn't just throw up a bunch of tents in the middle of a bunch of dunes, right? So I, I don't know why that market isn't back all the way down. And in fact, that's what I would do is put that all the way down uh, back in the, the starting place and have these options to buy, have these things that you can run into. Uh, one, one reason why you might... Um, well, it says that it's you know it's it's um, it's set up to help adventurers bound north. Again, everyone's going to be coming through that oasis, so it makes more sense for them to set up there. Uh, I would do that, but maybe there is something out here like a smaller oasis or something like that, a smaller 
community where the players could retreat if they needed to rest or something like that. Maybe that's what this is for, because it's it's pretty close to the Lost Tomb. Uh, and then you get the, the Ancient Battlefield, the Coffin, and the Wreckage. And then finally you get the tomb itself. And I really like the tomb map. I think it's great. It's, it's uh, looped pretty well, uh, especially down below. You get overall loops. You've got minor loops. So it's, it's pretty easily interconnected. It's only one level, so you don't go up and down. Um, you know, it gets more dangerous as you go deeper. And there are some pretty strong things in here. You got a, a, a water hydra, for example. As this, as you know, as I noted, this is a for level character levels four through six, so it's a, a much higher level adventure um, in that regard. But if you're here just to loot, then this is a great dungeon because you're going to be going through and trying to find uh, as much as you possibly can. Going through, going through. Um, good random encounter tables. A couple of them can't be repeated. The rest can pretty much. And then you get the descriptions of the rooms, and it's very easily laid out. Again, if, which is not my favorite um, heading font choice. The headers aren't my favorite. The room names, I don't like that font. But the actual font of the room is clear to read, easy to read. And you get the bullet points, the bolding, um, yeah, uh, par parenthetical text. Very, very useful. Uh, easy to read. And again, you've got uh, traps, and you have treasure, and you have tricks, and you have uh, factions, and you have... Uh, things to interact with, NPCs, both living and unliving. Uh, you've got lots of cool stuff going on in this dungeon. Really cool stuff. And then you've got the, uh, once you get to the end, you get the Harvesters, which is the, uh, the main rival adventuring party down here, and then different characters and what they want and what's going on. And then you have the NPCs that you can run into elsewhere. And then the magic items and the gravestone of decay. I'll read through this one because it's an awesome item. A weathered gravestone, cold to the touch, adorned with eerie swirling patterns. Etched onto it are hundreds of names, including normal names, kingdom names, and democracy. By chiseling the name of a person, place, or concept into the stone, it will begin to wither away until it dies and is completely forgotten. A person will take minutes, a city could take years, months or years, and entire concepts, freedom, justice, etc., could take decades to centuries. Anything that dies this way is gone forever and can only be restored by using the counterpart item, Tablet of Yearning, to chisel the lost person, place, or concept onto it. Only two simultaneous writings can exist. New writings can happen when one has run its course. At the moment, there is room for one, and in 120 years, when democracy will cease to exist, uh, there will be room for more. The stone can be destroyed if someone selflessly chisels their own name into the stone and be the last victim. The gods have banned the following concepts from being chiseled, death and faith. That's really cool. I mean, you know, lots of questions. <laughs> lots of questions there, and, and I think a lot of GMs are going to be like, nope, that's not going to work in my world. Uh, just kill some anybody? That's way too strong. But it's the death note idea, right? Except this is a huge gravestone, a tablet, a massive bit of stone. So you're not just easily going to be able to take it out of your pocket and write somebody's name on it, right? It's a big deal. Um, I mean, at least it's a it's a it's a stone, <laughs> so it's a chisel. It's it's a harder thing to just get somebody's name on there. A good party, and if you have the right kind of players, right, they're not going to use this because that's pretty pretty evil. If any of them read Death Note, they know what happens to someone who starts using something like this, right? But you could definitely see this as a quest, right? Like, okay, we have to recover this and get it somewhere safe or destroy it to find someone who's willing to do that. And one of the players might do it themselves. Maybe their patron wants to do it. Maybe someone else wants to do it or something like that. And so they've been sent here to get it. Um, you know, democracy is being destroyed. If this isn't destroyed, democracy itself will cease to exist. <laughs> There'd be plenty of people in the world who would want that to happen. So maybe your patron wants to ensure that it does. Who knows? I think it's a really cool concept for a world, and it's campaign-defining, right? I mean, this would be a whole thing. Your players would remember the Gravestone of Decay. So, fantastic, uh, fantastic result of the of the campaign. I really like that when when the end of a of an adventure kind of leads you into a bigger concept or a bigger idea. It doesn't have to. Right, you could just say the Gravestone of Decay only works on people, and then it's just like a dangerous magic item. But if you want this idea of concepts, then that's a really cool, big campaign-defining thing, world-defining thing. And if you wanted to, you could make that into a whole thing past this. So I like it. I, I like it a lot. Plus, there's a lot of other cool magic items in here that are quite strong. The Chrono Blade. <laughs> that's pretty cool. The Robes of Starlight. The Dagger of Second Chance. Stabbing a creature's a dead creature's heart, it comes back to life. If at any point the dagger is removed from the heart, the creature dies again instantly. <laughs> That's really interesting, right? So you stab somebody with this, it's stuck in there, and as long as it's in there, they're alive. Now the question is, what happens if they die while they have the dagger in their heart? I think they probably just die, right? So it's a second chance. It's not a, it's not a dagger of immortality. Um, but it's just stuck there. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. 
So the ideas in this dungeon are fantastic. You got some new monsters for old school essentials and then the uh, license agreement. This is only 29 pages, but it's really, really good. I think the uh, the Gravestone of Decay is a fantastic concept, a fantastic dungeon. It's again, the pay what you want on DriveThruRPG, so I'll put the link below to where you can get it. This one's definitely going in my list of, of adventures to run at some point. And finally, I wanted to cover the Vault of the Lunar King. Now, this was something I kickstarted a while back. It started off as a Dungeon 23 uh, randomly generated mega dungeon, 365 rooms. And then, as he says in the notes, about halfway through, he wanted it, he realized he could like actually put this together and make this a coherent thing, and so he did. So it's definitely more of a toolbox. Definitely more of a toolbox than anything else because you get good maps and good descriptions of the rooms, but you don't get monsters, you don't get stat blocks, you don't get um, you know level requirements or uh, damages or even magic item you know powers. It's left up to you almost entirely. So this is a toolbox for adventures and adventure design. Who is the Lunar King? There's a, there's a sort of overall thing happening here, and there's moon discs that have broken into 12 pieces and hidden throughout the dungeon so you can find them. Uh, here is the dungeon. It's 365 rooms broken into 12 levels, each one about 30, about 30 rooms. Um, you know, again, some of them are 31, some couple of them are 28 or 30, uh, but yeah, 28, 31, 30. Uh, nothing bigger than that, nothing smaller than 28. Uh, it's all hyperlinked, so you can go to the floor that you want. Now, again, what, what I think is really cool, once you see the maps, um, You'll, you'll see why I really like this. <laughs> Just so you have factions in here. Lunar Crew Cultists, Moon Creatures, Lunar Guardians, Space Pirates or Raiders, the Eclipse Cult, Lunar Harvesters, the Remnants of an Ancient Lunar Civilization, and Mad Scientists. Um, you, get, you could leave all this off, you could take all this in, whatever you want to do. If you run this dungeon as is, it's going to be a little bit funhousey, mega dungeon-y, right? But this is why I like it. Very clear room descriptions, section descriptions. You could take a room, a section, or a floor from this and run it in isolation as is. Because as you can see, it's just brief descriptions. And the maps are great, so you could just take this and use it. Every page details a different section of a, of a level. And they connect very clearly. So it's really, really well laid out. Now one thing I wish is, is that things these were hyperlinked. So you could click on it and go right to the page. I don't think it would be too hard. The, the whole PDF is only 53 pages, so adding those hyperlinks in wouldn't, it seems to me, make it too big. So I wish that were the case, but it's not. It's fine. You could do it yourself if you have uh, the right, the right software, you know, the right, the right tools. But as you can see, it's very simple, and uh, there's some really cool ideas. But you can tell it is a little, again, randomly generated in terms of its room layout in terms of the room sizes and the room shapes in terms of some of the room contents are like how would this be here right how would that be here and that's why i say if you run this just as is it's going to be a definitely a fun house dungeon but you take from this this is how i look at it you take from it and 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 get some ideas from it and add particular rooms into your dungeon or take in a level or a few rooms from your from this and put it into your world um, that's what i would do i use this as a toolbox rather than as a set mega dungeon to just run straight up because it's generated randomly, because it's generated, um, you know, in isolation, at least partially, you can take any of them out without doing damage to the room itself. And so you can just kind of combine them to, with other dungeons. So this is really cool. Again, 53 pages of this. 53 pages. Page and page and page and page of cool maps, cool descriptions, fun tricks and ideas. Very creative. There's obviously that moon theme, the lunar theme. But that's very, very light, and again, it doesn't doesn't impinge on any particular floor too, too much, and so you can kind of ignore it um, if you if you choose to, if you wouldn't, if you don't want to. Um, and then you get the last room with the Lunar King himself. Um, really cool. Now, this one, in order to get access to, as far as I can tell, you have to um, you have to subscribe to this guy's Patreon, um, Adventure Squared, but it's like a dollar. I think, for a month to get the lowest. So you could just get it right for a dollar and get uh, one month uh, of Patreon on the, for this guy and then pick up the Vault of the Lunar King and then unsubscribe, right? And he has other stuff on there too, so it wouldn't just be the one. Um, I am not currently subscribed. I, I don't um, patronize uh, <laughs> this guy. I'm not a patron or, pa yeah, not a patron. Um, I got it through Kickstarter. So that was that was how I got access to it. But I'll put links below to where you can get to his uh, Kickstarter, or his Kickstarter, his uh, Patreon, if you're interested. Because, again, I think it's really cool, and it's a great little toolbox uh, thing to have. All right, so Vault of the Lunar King, the Gravestone of Decay, and the Reptile House. Um, I'll put links below to where you can get them all. 
I hope this has been interesting, guys. I think these are all kind of cool. I like the fact that, uh, well, at least the first two are for higher level than level one, because you know, I'm pretty tired of level one dungeons uh, being just the norm. All right, anyways, anyway, I'll see you guys in another video.